Um, at this point, we want to bring Rob back on stage <laughs> and hear more about um, more from you, um, both because of the timeliness of the kicking off of the project, but also since today's topic was project scoping. Um, and as a friend of the DSSG program and CDO, uh, we know that Rob has a lot of lessons and wisdom to share with us about you know, what makes a good, effective, impactful data science project in the public sector, um, as well as some really great analogies. <laughs> so no pressure, but yeah, we'll hand it back over to you, Rob. An introduction like that is like starting at the North Pole, no matter which direction I head, it's going to be walking downhill from here. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm talking about just sort of tips and tricks for project scoping. And I have some notes so that I don't get distracted and start talking about random things that aren't applicable. Um, so as, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the problem that we face is that we have too many appeals um, and we need, to, we need to increase the quality of appeals and we need to reduce the volume of appeals, right? So we have two obvious target metrics, right? We want a low appeal rate and a very high win rate. Right, so few people appeal and the people who do appeal have a credible and a meaningful case to be made. And so they are very likely to win. Um, and so when we think about scoping out a data science project to sort of achieve these outcomes, we need, I have three steps here on my notes, right? So step, the, step, the first step is just write down a statement that says, I want someone to do something, right? And then fill in someone and something. So in our case, I want residential property owners to not submit to, 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 to not submit a frivolous appeal. And I want residential, some residential property owners to submit a meaningful appeal, right? Um, so there's sort of like two groups of people you believe uh, are out there, right? There's your false positive people, the people who are you know, raising an alarm about how inaccurate our assessment is, but in fact, our assessment is accurate. And then there are the people who fail to raise an alarm when our assessment is inaccurate until it's too late, until they get a bill and then they raise an alarm and then it's too late because their appeal window has closed. Um, and uh, so, so once you have sort of your action, I want someone to do something. Uh, hopefully, you know, for elected officials, this, this shouldn't just be, I want to get reelected again because fundamentally they could all just write that. We, hopefully the action would be policy related. Um, once you have your action, I want A to do B, you develop a theory of action, right? So then you wanna say, I believe that this per the person will do the thing if these conditions are true. So in our case, we believe that residential property owners are more likely to submit a frivolous appeal when they cannot determine whether their estimated market value is consistent with sale prices or similar in nearby homes. So if I tell you that I think your property is worth a half a million and you are just unable to look at the sales of similar properties, either because there's a technical barrier uh, in that you don't know how to do it, or there's, there's like a, a barrier in terms of ownership of data, that data is not available to you. You do not have a realtor's license. Um, you know, you, you're le more likely to submit an appeal. In the absence of, of knowledge, you just assume that we're wrong. Um, so, well, so that's a theory of action, right? Um, residential property owners are more likely to submit a meaningful appeal when they have easy access to all of the factors that went into the valuation of their property and they can easily determine whether or not those factors are accurate. Um, so if I am counting your proximity, your local school quality is a factor in my belief about your uh, property value, but I don't tell you that, then you can't challenge me on it. But you can't say, that's not even my local school. That's, that school's in Florida. I'm not even sure why you, you know, what's wrong with you. If you're not even given the opportunity to make that sort of challenge, uh, you know, you're not going to submit a good appeal to fix our problems. Um, and then the third step is, once you have identified the action you want, the people you want to take a, a particular action and you have identified um, a, a set of theories of action, what things motivate people to take the good actions or to, to, to not take the bad actions that you want to, to discourage. Finally, you say, how can I, what technological solution will uh, speak to those theories of action, right? So in our case, we say we want people to be able 
to look at all the sales of properties that are nearby them and similar to their property. We want them to just have access to that sales information and to be able to easily determine whether those sales are consistent with their valuation. That raises the interesting question, what do we mean by consistent? But that's a different, that is a problem that you'll have to solve later on. Um, and so you say, okay, I want an application that's gonna, I'm gonna put in a property, it's gonna find out where that property is located. It's gonna have the ability to easily plot uh, the other sales of similar properties on a map. Maybe we allow the user to judge how close uh, those sales have to be in order to be considered close enough. Uh, maybe we allow the user the ability to, to, to change the tolerances about physical characteristics. Um, and, and maybe we also plot uh, those sales on graphs that would show what we mean by consistent. How close do you have to be to the center of the distribution in order to be considered close enough? Um, you know, some people, uh, when we send them a, a valuation of say half a million dollars and they say, it's, it's definitely not worth more than 485. And we're like a $15,000 difference on a half million valuation is within the confidence interval of that valuation. And then they look at me and they say, I think I understand most of those words individually, but when you put them together, I have no idea what you just said to me. And so we have to then say what I just said, which is that 485 is not statistically different from 500,000. Um, it's, not, it's not reasonable to hold our office to that level of precision because almost nobody can achieve that level of precision using uh, algorithms. Uh, we have to sort of show, convince the taxpayer of that visually or graphically. Um, so that's sort of three steps to scoping out a project. I want someone to do something. Uh, I think they do those things that I want them to do when the following things are true, A, B, and C. And I believe that I can build a piece of technology that'll accomplish at least A and B. Maybe not C, but we can get A and B. Um, some other considerations that we thought about was that you know, volunteers, like soup kitchen, like if you're gonna go work for a soup kitchen, the volunteers, they wanna serve the food. They don't wanna clean up the dishes. So don't have a project where the bulk of the work is boring, technically difficult data manipulation or dealing with ambiguity or dealing with policy, uh, let's say ambiguity or policy in action, right? If you have two executives in your organization, they have a different view of what this project should be. Do not put the, the, the volunteers in the position of negotiating between your schizophrenic parents. Like you need to have a project that is going to be fun and engaging to work on and that is not going to make them wanna cry and quit because they'll just quit. They'll skip the crying and go straight to the quitting. Um, I would suggest an agile mindset. So break, if you have a very large project, break it into chunks and each chunk should be achievable independent of the other chunk of work. So breaking the project into chunks where each chunk is dependent upon the next chunk, that is not agile. That, that's, that's still waterfall. You need to break the project up and say, if I can just deploy this one small piece of work, it would be a, a meaningful improvement independent of all the other pieces. Um, because if a team member leaves, if a team member fails to achieve a particular out goal, it shouldn't threaten the viability of the entire project. It only threatens the viability of that particular feature that you want to include. So for the sales comparables, listen, do we have to have a map, a graph, a download feature, and the ability to adjust different parameters to adjust the sales selection? Each of those is a separately achievable outcome. If somebody fails on to produce one of those, the rest of the project can still move forward and you still have achieved a meaningful improvement in the, in the tool. Um, and I think I left a uh, point, uh, oh, don't let, uh, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good, right? Which is similar to the Agile, right? Um, if you don't get the entire thing that you thought you wanted, ask yourself, is this still a meaningful improvement over the current state? And if the answer is, yeah, it's better, it's not the best thing you could have done, go with it, right? Because why not move yourself forward a little bit uh, just because you couldn't move yourself forward all the way. Sort of like, well, I can't save enough money to buy a house this month, so I'm never going to save money to buy a house. It's, that's the logic of, of allowing the perfect to get in the way of the good. Um, that's not an endorsement of home ownership. Uh, so the final point that I would make is 
if you, you, you need to have a plan to measure the success of the project before you begin the project. If you cannot, so this is very common in both the private sector and the public sector, but in the private sector, there are market forces um, that sort of discourage this type of thinking, uh, more so I think than in the public sector. Um, you can't release a product in the private sector and then tell everyone it was a success and have it be a success simply because you told everyone it was a success. At some point, that product will start to pile up in your warehouse and when they find that, that they haven't been selling it, you've been sneaking into the warehouse at night, bundling up bunches of the product and, and dumping them in the lake. When they find you like, you know, what are you doing? And we thought this was a great success. Well, no, I've just been throwing them out. We just telling you we've been selling them. Somebody will find out that you're not selling your product. And so the whole thing will collapse. Unfortunately, in the public sector, it often takes a lot longer for the public to recognize that something was not as successful as it has been built. And so you need to build into your project a metric for success. How do we know that we did a good job? And if you can't, then you can't prove it was a success. And you, it's not appropriate to have the default be, we think we're winning all the time unless someone proves us wrong. The default, which should be, we think we're failing all the time unless we can prove that we're right. right? So build in a metric for success. It will help you with the first part as well. I wanna do party A, I want party A to take some action the one metric for success is did they do the thing that you wanted them to do? Um, and you need to be able to observe that thing that you want them to do. So those are my notes and I stayed on topic mostly. So that's success. Uh, I think I can take questions. Yeah. So, so Rob, this is, this is really interesting and you're in, you know, you're in deep in, in, in the weeds. At, at some level, this sounds like, you know, you, you're, you're estimating numbers and, and these numbers, are, are sort of, you know, arbitrary values of, of things and, and you can sort of argue about free market and all that stuff. What's, what's, you know, so we're here talking about how do we do this for social impact? What's the social good here in this project? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I don't want to undersell us, but I also don't want to oversell us. Like fundamentally, we just need to do our jobs well, um, because when we fail to do our jobs well, we shift an enormous amount of tax burden on to low income members of society. So there's some research that has shown um, that over a, a longer period of time, roughly $50 billion worth of tax liability was shifted from higher wealth, property wealth individuals to lower property wealth individuals, right? So it's sort of like, it's like if when our office is not functioning properly, in many ways, it's like stealing a penny from every bank account in America, right? Any, any single individual may not be hurt terribly uh, much, but as a group, right, low income property owners get hurt a lot. And it's just one of the many ways in which low income people face a drain on their resources. I mean, they pay more for a can of beans in the local corner shop than they do down, down in a nice neighborhood. Um, you know, and, and so there's lots of they pay more for banking services, they pay more for everything. They shouldn't pay more for property taxes, because by law, property taxes are just proportionate to how much real estate wealth you have. And so if we do our jobs well, um, everyone pays their fair amount of the collective burden of society as defined by law. I mean, you can argue about how you think the law should structure that, that burden, but at least our office administratively can meet however the law has structured it. Yeah, no, this is, this is great, right? And, and we've talked about this before where, and, and a lot of you are probably familiar with, right? if you are just like everything else, if you're richer, richer and have more resources, you can challenge Mm -hmm. these values and get it reduced. Whereas if you don't know that that's possible, don't have the resources and don't have access to people who can, then, then you can't. So, so what seems like, you know, well, you're just assessing values, as you say, has a huge impact and disproportionate impact on, on people who tend to own, own you know, lower value homes and, and can't. Uh, and so if you do it right the first time, yes, it helps everyone, but it disproportionately helps uh, people who are traditionally, you know, have been, have been in that situation. So um, yeah, I just I, want to kind of make that, that point because we started assuming that there is, that, that there is something good. And that's kind of key part of the scoping process is kind of trying to identify exactly, you know, what social impact are we trying to have? Um, and so this was, this was a really good distinction that you made. Yeah. If the government is not proactive about doing its job well, and it places the onus on the public to sort of like complain 
when they're not doing, they're like, you know, we're going to do a mediocre job, but you always have these ability to sort of like ex post, you as the public have the ability to ex post, try to correct our mistakes. That will always lead, always lead to a biased outcome because wealthy people will have the resources to avail themselves of those corrective measures and poor and, and less wealthy people and poor people will not. Um, when we reassessed the North, the assessor received personal communication on LinkedIn from taxpayers complaining about their assessment. Only somebody who's makes $200,000 a year and has a law degree. And he, when he goes on LinkedIn, he looks, he's a third degree connection with the assessor. And he, only that kind of person thinks that they can eat, they can message the assessor on LinkedIn, like he's going to respond and do something about it. You know, you don't see people who work at a bar doing that. You don't see people who own a $75,000 house and they're a retired 65 year old going on LinkedIn and writing a, a five paragraph outraged. I'm outraged that you think that my property is worth one in $1.7 million. It's clearly only one and a half million. Oh, my mistake, you know? Uh, so yeah, it, the, the, if you, if you set up a way, uh, if you set up something that, that, uh, that allocates access based on uh, education, wealth, or connection, you're going to have, you're going to inevitably have a biased outcome. Yeah, Rob, thank you so much for walking us through the project and also everything you've learned. I have one question that's uh, from an audience member and they, uh, they also work in a county appraiser's office. Can you talk a little bit about some of the ways you're going to be making the solve uh, project uh, open source so other people can also follow uh, the project and the solution that you guys work towards? Right, so the dream in my department, in my office, is that you have different layers or different circles or depths of access to the tools that we build. Um, it should serve the most, the most obvious constituency, which is your typical taxpayer who just wants to know some basic facts about their assessment. But there are people who are more sophisticated, right? And so we want to build these layers in so that people who are more sophisticated can go deeper and deeper into it and we, it should be end to end. So it should answer the most basic questions for the most, the simplest user. And for the most advanced user, they should be able to access all of the code that drives the application and all of the data that's required for the meaningful outcomes. And that is the goal. So the Pinval application is actually already on GitLab because we already use it internally. So all of that code base is there. And then once we migrate that to the public, we're gonna have to figure out like how to package up the data that drives the application and, um, and, and make it available to the public. And there are some considerations in that uh, most like, you know, the easiest thing would be to just make the database that drives the application available to the public, but that's just going to result in somebody trying to dump the whole thing, like right, right when everyone else is trying to use it and crash our website. So there's like performance issues associated with that. So we have to figure out ways of mirroring just the most important parts. Um, you know, and then we've got, we, we mostly have both of those ends and we have to fill in the middle. So we have like, you know, stuff that answers the most basic questions and we have our source code, but like, there's no, there's right now not much of a middle ground. So we have to build in the different layers of understanding. Yeah. And the thing we'll touch upon later when we go through the project scoping worksheet too, is we find as we go through these problems, there's like these general problems and the solutions you build if you sub in, you know, different data, maybe different features, you can solve the same kind of problem in different jurisdictions. So definitely for somebody else who's also at, you know, at a county assessor's office, they could utilize your solution in their own kind of platform, plug in their data, and because of its open source nature, can then start to apply it. And I think that's something we try to uh, emphasize across DSSG and also solve. So I think that's really cool to hear that you're also doing that. Yeah, we have a package actually that we've just released um, called assess R, uh, all one word, <laughs> and it's an R. It's an R package, and it's designed to help other assessors' offices, um, you know, get to the same level of technical sophistication without having to redesign the wheel every single time. Oh, that's amazing! That's so good to hear. Okay. We have one more question from the audience. Um, uh, can this be thought of as a kind of explainable system? based on the factors determining the property cost and the percent contribution to the cost in real time for property tax? Almost. So I think the question is asking whether or not the, the homeowner can say, I live in a two bedroom, one bath house. The two bedrooms add 
$100,000 to the value of my house. The one bedroom adds another 25,000. And then there's some adjustment for the location of my house, right? That is appraisers are very used to seeing that. So a lot of appraisers have these like lookup tables and they look up, they look up a, a physical attribute and it tells them how much to add to the value of the house, right? So in statistical parlance, we call that a marginal effects table. So when you run a regression, if it's a linear regression, right, you can recapture those types of marginal effects. The problem is, is that if you use something other than a linear regression, like gradient boosting, or you use quantile methodology, or you use a random forest algorithm, you cannot produce marginal effects. Uh, in fact, by definition, the reason GBM is more successful in many cases than a linear model is it doesn't force the coefficients, the estimated coefficients, to be constant across the vector, right? So you can have curvature in all of these relationships and GBM finds those curves. The problem is, is that it means that marginal effect is basically like pointless. Um, and so that is actually a really high technical lift because we use, we are, ag we are model agnostic. We use whatever algorithm produces the most accurate uh, results. And sometimes linear models do produce more accurate results than gradient boosting, right? And so we need to have, <laughs> and this is a little bit in the weeds, but we basically need to have the application be able to access the model that was used for that particular property. And then depending on how that model estimated the value, like apply a somewhat technically complex transformation to get back that marginal effects table. Um, it's a great question because right now the expectation in the industry is that we do have a marginal effects table, but from a technical standpoint, if you're going to use machine learning approaches, the, t the marginal effects table becomes a much more difficult thing to produce on demand. But we're working on it. Maybe, maybe a team member will figure it out. That's a, that's a challenge for Saul. Yeah. I think that's a challenge across like all of data science is to unblack box uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, yeah. For sure. Explainability. Well, thank you so much, Rob. Um, if anyone